This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. I'd like to welcome you to the monthly free public lecture sponsored by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. Uh, we are a not-for-profit volunteer organization founded in 1990 for the purpose of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education. We're one of the largest local vegetarian societies in the country with approximately 2,000 members. Tonight's lecture is being videotaped for broadcast on our weekly TV series entitled Vegetarian. On Oahu, the program airs Thursdays at 6 p.m. on Olelo Channel 52. We recommend that you set your VCR to record the show because if you like it, you can keep it and share it, and if for any reason you don't want to, you can tape over it for the next time. Also, many of our previous lectures can be viewed online on our website at vsh.org. And tonight's lecture will be added to that selection soon. It's now time for our special guest. We're delighted to welcome back to Hawaii, Dan Peraro. Mr. Peraro first published his internationally syndicated comic feature, Bizarro, in 1986. He's also published 14 books and has traveled the nation as a stand-up comedian. Bizarro has won numerous awards, including unprecedented three consecutive Best Panel Awards from the National Cartoonist Society. He and his wife live in New York City and are passionate vegans and animal rights environmental activists. Tonight, Mr. Peraro will discuss the humorous side of vegetarianism. Please welcome Dan Peraro. Let's have another hand for my opening act. She was hysterical, was she not? <laughs> All right. Oh, look here. I got laid. <laughs> Thank you. This is beautiful. It smell, it smells good, too. Or, at least it smells better than I do. That's all I can really tell you. So anyway, uh, thanks so much for coming out tonight. I appreciate it. So I just want to tell you um, a funny story on myself first. When I first got here... But the very first time I came to Hawaii was, I think, two years ago. I didn't know anything about the local language beyond aloha. That was all I knew. I didn't know anything else about Hawaiian language or any words, nothing. I knew nothing about it, right? So when I very first got here, I went to this uh, resort with these other people, and I saw these signs that said, uh, like, uh, please keep off the grass, mahalo. Parking for guests only, mahalo. No smoking, mahalo. And so being from New York... I naturally assumed that mahalo meant asshole. <laughs> Stay off the grass, mahalo. Parking for guests only, mahalo. No smoking, mahalo. So this became, this is just kind of become a running gag with my wife and I. And every time we want to use that word, we use mahalo instead when we're in New York or whatever. It's like, you know, what's with this mahalo at the light? Who doesn't, it's green, you freaking mahalo. It's... Now that's our, that's, our, that's our new word, so we're going to try to spread that. But now we stole that. We can't. We can't spread that because we stole it from you guys. So I, I, I wrote a song for you guys. I always like to open up every show with a song. Uh, so I'm going to do a song for you guys. Let me get my guitar. And I, I hope I can remember all the lyrics because I, I wrote it especially for this occasion. But let me just grab my guitar real quick. Give me a hand while I grab my guitar. It is, it is a lot more humid here than it is back home. It's almost impossible to keep this in tune. All right, we'll give it a shot. 
Well, I came from New York City to... Well, I'll tell you what. So you get the joke, it's a cardboard guitar, very funny. The song actually sounds a lot better on a real instrument, so let me just get my real instrument. All right. Takes me a second to get hooked up. All right. Sometimes I can't even see in here at the... Uh, where's my damn... Uh, there it is. All right, here we go. Are you ready? But it'll ding, 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 ding. Well, I came from New York City to Honolulu, USA. I came to talk to my vegetarian homies today. They're all dressed up to see me in tuxedos and long gowns. I guess I'll have to rewrite that one. At least they got dressed to see me. Public nudity is frowned on in this town. But the most important thing is they're the coolest cats around. There's a guy there in the front row. I think he's got a gun. No, wait, he's just glad to see me. That's good, cause he's gonna have fun. Who's that guy up on the stage right there? Does he wear a hat because he's losing his hair? Could that be the famous Dan Pararo? Is he the degenerate who draws Bizarro? I can't believe I'm in the room with such an awesome guy. Am I cool enough to be his friend? If I was, then I would die. But well, I came from New York City to Honolulu, USA. I came to talk to my Hawaiian Vegetarian Society homies today. They're not dressed up to see me in tuxedos and long gowns but the most important thing is they're the coolest cats in town i'm so happy to be here in honolulu usa with my very funny looking guitar i do not know how to play thank you And uh, the, um, the funny guitar is uh, courtesy of our videographer, the Right Reverend Dr. William Harrison. <laughs> All right, well, this is a little different. I, uh, sometimes I do these kind of talks, and sometimes I do uh, comedy clubs and stuff, and you guys are so much more quiet and sober than the people in a comedy club, which is why I, I always ask if they'll serve booze at these events, but of course the, the Vegetarian Society, they can't afford to serve booze at these events, and it's probably illegal too, so I guess I'll just have to do with a quiet, uh, sort of reasonable, uh, sober, logical crowd. But that's okay. You guys will get, you'll, you'll understand a lot more of the stuff. Just kind of get you caught up on my life. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. <clears throat> I was conceived. I was, I divided, I divided again. I became one of those uh, mushrooms in the hot and sour soup. And then I was born. <clears throat> I got married. I got pregnant, and then I gave birth to a puppy. See, at that point, I became a teenager. Oh, yeah, that's me. Uh, that's me in uh, 1976, uh, Groovy Dude Dan. Here's a shot of me about a year later with my dad. I call this, uh, I call this picture Dad and the Tranny. You might remember I showed a picture of my dad earlier. There he is in the yellow. So, um... And uh, then I went into my uh, transgender phase, where, I, uh, where I, I was Frida Kahlo for a while. If you know the, if you know the art of Frida Kahlo, you'll get that one. Oh, 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 it's time for a pop quiz. Um, I also do a column. One of the other things I do is a column for Veg News Magazine. How many of you guys know Veg News Magazine? All right, cool. Did you know I do a column for them? Have you read it before? Yeah, I do. I do a column for Veg News Magazine. I just said that. 
How many people are vegetarian as opposed to vegan or not vegetarian? How many people are vegetarian? There's no judgmental thing, so you can feel free to raise your hand. Okay. How many people are vegan? Okay. How many people are corpse eaters? <laughs> oh, come on. There's a whole lot of you didn't raise your hand. What are you? What are you eating? How many people eat dust only? Dust only. <laughs> dust? Okay. How many people are on a, uh, a, a protein-rich diet eating only hair and hooves? Hair and hooves. Nobody? Oh, one lady. Wow, you look pretty good. Of course, you're only 16, so that's probably a testament to the diet. All right. Uh, let me see if I can find my article in here. So I just wanted to, I, uh, this, the article this month, it's different every month, but in this, this particular issue, there's a pop quiz. Uh, which most closely resembles your body type? A, Angelina Jolie slash Brad Pitt. All right. B, Oprah Winfrey slash Fred Thompson. C, Angelina, Brad, Oprah, and Fred all stuffed into a duffel bag. All right. We'll get to some more questions later after we... Uh, after we look at some cartoons. My mother used to puke in my mouth. <laughs> this is one of the many reasons that I'm not a bazillionaire is because uh, <laughs> my cartoons require at least a fifth grade education to understand and you, you rule out about 80% of the American audience when you do that. But anyway, I just wanted to address a little bit about the way I was raised. My mother did not use to puke in my mouth, that I know of. But she, uh, but she didn't really feed me a particularly optimum diet. She, Finish your Pepsi and Cheetos or you don't get dessert. <laughs> this is the way a lot of people eat today. Uh, you, see, you see these people dragging their kids into, into uh, uh, what do you call them, uh, fast food restaurants. And like just, just stuffing them full of all kinds of horrible things. Uh, I was raised that way. I was, I was stuffed full of all horrible things when I was a kid. Uh, we all were, I guess. But, in, but then later in life, uh, I started reading a little bit more about nutrition and stuff. And, you know, there's different... I'm a vegan, and there's different kinds... Uh, this is important for the, for the sort of people who came here, maybe, because they, they know my cartoons and don't know anything about the, the whole vegan vegetarian thing. I used to be... And, like, right now, there's probably people sitting out there who, who, who just came to hear me talk because they like my cartoon or whatever. And you probably think that, like, vegetarians are hippies with too much spare time, right? That is what I always thought. I, I used to think, I used to make fun of it. I used to think that all vegetarians and vegans especially probably just lived in an old VW van, you know, down by the river somewhere uh, that reeked of patchouli, unlike me. So, so I used to make fun of vegans and vegetarians. I thought they were all freaks and stuff. <clears throat> and then I met um, uh, this, this woman and nothing will, will, will uh, enable you to see something with new eyes like trying to get someone to go to bed with you. And I, I mean, I'm sorry, like a new relationship is what I meant to say. That's what I meant to say. So, you know, you're in a new relationship and you're with this other... And this is, and this is I mean, I had had friends that were vegan and vegetarian and I just thought, I just poo-pooed anything they said or thought. And I said, okay, fine, whatever. You do your thing, I'll do my thing. I know what I'm doing. So I started dating this lady and I, le I learned a lot quickly. She wasn't like evangelizing, but I was just sort of interested in it because I was interested in her. So I was interested in everything that she thought. And she really knew her stuff. She, she had been vegetarian since she was a kid. She decided to do it on her own. She, she had been reading about it all her life. Stuff. Well, anyway, she, she just very, very quickly changed my mind. I, I, I started to uh, reassess my lifestyle and I thought, you know, A, B, C, D, what am I doing? And I stopped doing it. Um, but people are vegan or vegetarian for different reasons. Some people for health. Some people for environmental reasons and some people for ethical reasons because of uh, cruelty to animals. And I, w I became vegan entirely for ethical reasons. It wasn't about my health. It wasn't about the environment because I didn't know much about those things. It was entirely because I decided that I did not want to participate in, in cruelty to anything sentient any animal that knew it was alive and, and could experience fear. I just decided that, that, that being a, like for instance, most people will say, most Americans will say that they are compassionate to animals. Like if I ask, if I ask this audience, how many people here enjoy cruelty to animals? How many people enjoy being cruel to animals? Not one person raises their hand. But every time you buy, any time, and I realize this, any time I bought a product made from an animal, I was subsidizing a great deal of cruelty. And it's not something that I would have done on my own. It wasn't something I was doing for survival. I'm not talking about third world countries. I'm talking about the United States, 20th century, 21st century now. None of these things are necessary. We do it because it's fun, because it tastes good. Or we buy fur because it feels good. We don't need that to stay warm. 
How many people here have a fur coat in Hawaii? I'm going to shoot you if you raise your hand. I am going to shoot you with a gun right now. I don't even have a gun. I will go out and buy a gun and come back and shoot you if you have a fur coat in Hawaii. Okay, good. Nobody. <laughs> we'll talk more about this in a moment. Keep the pictures rolling so people don't get bored. The government food pyramid must be working. More Americans than ever are looking like pyramids. You cannot trust the government food pyramid. You cannot, actually, I could shorten that sentence. You cannot trust the government. <laughs> and I'm hoping that that changes now that Barry Rockstar Obama, Barockstar Obama, Hawaii's own, I'm hoping that he changes that. But up until now, anyway, you cannot, up until January 20th and everything previously, you cannot trust the government food pyramid. It's not about medicine. It's not about science. It's about the health of the food industry. It's about the economic health of the food industry. And, and any doctor or nutritionist who really studies the information now and doesn't just remember the stuff they learned in med school back in the 70s, but if they're really studying that, that subject now, they will agree. The stuff they tell you to eat is not what you should be eating, not in those quantities and stuff. Because look what happened, you know, they, they changed that whole food pyramid in the 70s and the whole country just blew up. We're the, heaviest, like, we're the heaviest society in the world now. Do you know that in England recently, the theaters in the theater district in England have gone about, uh, they've all had to, tear, they're tearing out their chairs and replacing them with larger seats because American tourists cannot fit into the English theater. This is not a joke. It is a joke, but it's true. This is, a tr this is absolutely true. Americans don't fit. Most Americans don't fit into those chairs anymore. You go to what I call the flyover states, like where I'm from, Oklahoma. When I go home to visit my family in Oklahoma, and my family's not huge, but they're all, they're all overweight. Every single one of my family except me is overweight. But they all think that there's something wrong with me. They want to take me to the doctor. They want to feed me constantly because I look like, what do I, do I look like I just walked out of a prison camp? I'm not that thin. I'm just like a normal-sized guy. But in Oklahoma... You know, I'm ready for intervention. They want to they wanna drag me down to the local all-you-can-eat buffet for nine ninety five, which is the size of a Target. We had a family reunion one time a few years ago, and we went to this all-you-can-eat buffet place. The, the building was literally the size of a grocery store. And the center a thing with the 453 different aisles of food was like the size of this room. And everybody in there was like this, with piles of food bigger than Abraham Lincoln's hat. And... And they were on their second and third. And that's just America now. It's crazy what we do to ourselves. We're also killing the environment with it. We've been instructed to conduct a separate set of tests for American passengers. <laughs> These kinds of things are true. Um, you know, safety belts and, I mean, all that kind of stuff. You know, safety equipment and stuff. It was originally designed for people who weigh, who kind of look more like this. And now so many, you know, like 60% of Americans are like this. Feel free to laugh at everything because it just makes me feel better. <laughs> so this is where you could end up. This is where you could end up if you don't, if you're not eating right, you're going to end up at the proctologist and it's, it's going to be a lot less fun than this guy's having. Uh, <laughs> if you like paying strangers to probe your backside, then, you know, keep eating your meat. Dr. Neil Barnard, he famously said, if you think that beef is real food for real people, you'd better live real close to a real good hospital. <laughs> Look at how many people die of heart disease and stroke every year. It's way more than, than die of uh, lung cancer. And that comes, in, that comes almost entirely from people's diets. And a lot of cancers, too, come from our diets. Yet nobody, we don't have big warning signs on food. You know, you don't have these commercials telling people to stop eating McDonald's hamburgers because it's killing them. And it's killing tens of thousands of more people every year than, than cigarettes do. Cigarettes is nothing compared to what, what the food is doing. So there I am, kissing a chicken. That picture was taken at Woodstock Farm Animal Sanctuary, which is an animal sanctuary in uh, Woodstock, New York that my wife and I are founding board members of. Now, when I first, a, 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 farm, a farm animal sanctuary is a place where they rescue farm animals. They come from all kinds of weird different places and they live out their lives and they don't go to slaughterhouses, et cetera, et cetera. So a, a sanctuary was, a, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. Go on, thanks for coming, but it's time for you to go. 
Say what? Am I on Maui? No, this is Oahu. I was on Maui last week. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. A couple of mahalos, right? Uh, so what were we talking about? Oh, so I went to a farm animal sanctuary, and I met these guys in person. Cows, chickens, pigs, ducks, geese, turkeys. And seriously, I mean, somebody laughed out about in person, but it's true. Like, when you meet somebody's dog, you feel like you're meeting them in person, right? A dog has a personality, and they're different, right? Dogs are very, all dogs are different. They have different personalities. Some of them are smart, some of them are not. Like people, don't like people. Learn things, don't like things. They like this, they like that. They, these two get along, those two don't, etc. right? And we tend to think because dogs and cats are this way and we've incorporated them into our families, we tend to, you know, we give them a lot of special laws, a lot of special protection. If you're cruel to a dog or a cat, you can actually go to jail. But I always thought, as most people do, I think, that farm animals are different somehow. They're like less intelligent, less personality, less this, less that. I always kind of thought that they were dumb eating machines that don't, didn't know if they were alive or dead and, uh, and didn't particularly care as long as they were you know, lived on a happy farm with sunshine and grass, and they were killed quickly and politely, what's the harm, right? Well, when I found out none of them live in the sunshine, well, virtually none of the ones that you eat, there's like 90 billion, uh, no, what is it? It's uh, how many, uh, 10 billion, 10 billion a year, 10 billion uh, farm animals a year in the United States are killed. You don't see 10 billion farm animals out on those roadside farms. That's like 1%, less than 1% of the animals that are killed every year are out in those farms. The rest of them are in these packed warehouses, these factory farms, which are destroying the environment. <clears throat> anyway, so I met these, these pigs, pigs and chickens and cows, and I was, I was shocked to find out that they have different personalities. They're like cats and dogs. They're, they're different personalities. They're very, they experience all kinds of uh, uh, moods and emotions, and they like this and they don't like that, and there's some smart, some dumb. I thought, wow, they're just like cats and dogs, or human children for that matter. For that matter. Why, you know, what, if, if I wouldn't do these things to a cat or a dog, why am I doing it to them? And I quit. And then as soon as I quit, I thought, oh, my God, how hard is this going to be? When I decided I wasn't going to eat any animal product anymore, I thought, how hard is this going to be? Is this going to be as hard as it was when I quit smoking? You know, is it going to be that difficult? Is it going to be as hard as it was when I kicked heroin? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I never kicked heroin. As it turns out, it was actually easier than I thought it would be, and it was more a matter of substitution than sacrifice. I just, I, I, I still find all these really great favorite foods of mine, but they're just vegan instead of full, chock full of nasty stuff that I don't want to be eating. How am I supposed to relax in a world where truffle can mean either chocolate or fungus? So this is, this is me, this is my angst as a vegetarian. I love chocolate, as a vegan, I mean, I love chocolate and I hate mushrooms. I don't, trust, I don't trust fungus. Fungus is something that grows, grows under your fingernails and between your toes and you try to get rid of. Uh, it's something that grows under the porch in the dark. Uh, it scares me. It has a, a weird texture. It's not really, a, oh, and I read about this, in fact, it's not really a plant and it's not really an animal. It has kind of qualities of both. It's not sentient. I mean, to me, to me it's like I won't kill anything. I won't, I won't, uh, I won't participate in the misery of, of a sentient being. Fungus are not sentient. I'm not, you know, I'm not ethically against eating mushrooms. I'm mouthily against eating mushrooms. I don't like them in my mouth. I would actually rather have a stranger's sock in my mouth than a mushroom. I, the special sounds good, but can I substitute the pork chop for a fried chunk of your left buttock? Pigs are incredibly intelligent. Oh, and this is another thing that's kind of interesting philosophically. When we say an animal's intelligent, what we really mean is that it's, an, it's, its type of intelligence is close to ours, right? I mean, that's really the, what it is. You know, and we're like, oh, well, no, you know, we're all so high and mighty about, yeah, we are incredibly intelligent, incredibly intellectually complex. That's our whole problem. That is our entire problem. I mean, that's what's wrong. Human beings are all that is wrong with the world. Think about it. Everything that's wrong with this world is because of human beings, is because of us, the hairless primates with remote controls. We are the ones that have, if, a, if an alien came to this planet and saw the, and they'd say, oh, well, this works, that works, this works, oh, here's a problem, oh, it's because of them. Oh, here's a problem, oh, it's because of them. Well, get rid of them and the whole planet's going to heal itself in a hundred years or so and everything would be fine again, right? It is up to each one of us, I think. I'm not going to sit here and tell you what it's up to you. You do what you want. But 
I feel like it's up to me to do a little something to be a less arrogant ape on this planet than I, was, uh, than, than I could be. I'd like to leave the place a little better for my having been here instead of a whole lot worse. Uh, so that's my, uh, that's my story. Uh, pigs are actually uh, more intelligent than dogs, so if you wouldn't eat dog bacon, you probably might not want to eat pig bacon. It is kind of weird how, uh, this is something I used to think about long before I ever did this uh, diet switch, is I thought, every now, and, uh, every now and then I would play this game, it's like, why will I eat pork, but I wouldn't eat dog or cat? And some people will eat anything. I mean, I know a lot of people will like go to, you know, they'll go to China and eat monkey brain soup out of a live monkey's head and all kind of weirds. I'm not, I, you know, most people are not like that. I'm not like that. I was never that guy. But I would eat, you know, it's like, what, what, why will I eat a pig, but I won't eat a dog? Well, because dogs are cuter than pigs. I don't know. Why, why is that? It's, it would disgust me to eat a dog. If somebody hands me a glass of uh, cow milk, I'm like, oh, milk, yeah. Somebody asks you, <laughs> hands you a glass of, of, uh, Dog milk, would you drink that? You know, it's, it kind of grosses you out, right? I mean, if somebody hands you cat milk, would you drink that? Oh, is my, my cat's pregnant, and uh, the kitten, some of the kittens weigh a little extra milk because some of the kittens died, so I, here, here's a nice glass, here's, some, here's a bottle of cat milk from our cat. Just a little, just a little uh, welcome to the neighborhood gift. <laughs> Want to make you feel welcome. Would you drink? That's nasty. Come to think of it, if you went to the store and there was an entire aisle full of human milk, just from random mothers all across the country who are making a little extra money by selling their milk. Would you drink human milk from a random stranger? It'd be a lot healthier for you than cow's milk. At least it's the same species. You wouldn't though, right? So why do we drink cow milk? It's just a, it's a PR job. It's done on us since we're a kid, right? And uh, milk is baby food. Milk is incredibly fattening because you want to get your baby big enough and fat, I mean, big and fat, fast enough that a, that a predator can't carry it away. That's the whole point of, of milk. Make it big and fat as quick as you can so nothing can carry it off. That is the point of milk. It's baby food. No other species in the world drinks any milk past the age of getting teeth. Once you get teeth, you quit. You don't need milk anymore. It's nonsense. This whole idea that milk it does a body good, it's, that is a medical lie. Am I right? Am I right, Dr. Harris? That is an absolute medical lie. What are you getting from milk? Vitamin D? Well, you can get that from the sun. There's none of it around here, of course, but in some cities you can get that from the sun. <laughs> And calcium, there's more calcium in, in uh, fruit and leafy green vegetables than there is in milk anyway. And it doesn't come with all that nasty fat and hormones and all that other crap. So there you go. So <laughs> I debunked that. Nobody, no more, nobody here is going to drink milk ever again. It'll also kill you. Oh, that's another thing they found. This osteoporosis myth is that the societies that drink the most milk have the highest rates of osteoporosis. It ends up leaching calcium when you drink a ton of, or when you just consume a lot of animal protein, I guess. Is that how it is? It leaches calcium out of your bones to try to process it. So the more of that crap you eat, the less calcium you have in your bones. Congratulations. How's the chicken tonight? Happy and healthy. That's Satan. Is there anybody here who doesn't know who, what Satan is? Satan, I didn't know what Satan was before I became vegan. Yeah. Oh, good. I'm not going to explain it. I just wanted to point you out. And <laughs> uh, I had no idea what Satan was either. Um, I am now a Satan worshiper. I love Satan. Uh, I belong to a Satan cult. Satan is, I think it's a Japanese word, isn't it? Satan, I think it's a Japanese word. But it's a, um, it's a mock meat. It, 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 it tastes, looks, and feels very much like chicken or something, but it's made out of what? Wheat? Satan is made of wheat. So you make a lot of these mock meats and stuff. And if it's done properly, you can make Satan as so much like chicken that a meat eater won't know the difference. And that's why I say a lot, of, a lot of my diet is now about substitution instead of sacrifice. I eat those kind of things instead of those kind of things. And everybody's happy. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Stroke, it's what's for later. <laughs> yeah, that's the, uh, yeah, Dr. Neil Barnard. If you think meat is real food for real people, you better live real close to a real good hospital. Assault a duck in front of your kid? Give them a doll to stop them crying. I mean, this is kind of a weird cartoon, but it, it the reason I did this is because children sort of innately understand, right? You, you teach your children to be compassionate to animals, as I was taught to be compassionate to animals. If my parents caught me killing an animal, they would, they would drive me, you know, take me straight to a shrink. But then they're feeding me these dead animals that they paid somebody else to kill. 
So it's a weird kind of mixed message. And this is what happened to my wife. I mean, when I found out where my food was coming from, I just accepted it and went ahead and kept eating it. But, 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 but my wife, when she was, a, she was a little kid, and when she found out where meat came from, she just refused to eat it. She just stopped. That's not right. That's not nice. Not doing it anymore. So she became a vegetarian, first one in the history of her family. You know, had to learn on her own how to do it and where to get it and where to shop. And this was like way back in the 1980s. So that was like before you could buy soy milk in the stores and stuff. So it was a lot harder. Back then, to buy any kind of, any kind of vegetarian food, you had to go to the little, the little wooden shack run by the hippie with the incense burning and, the, you know, and everything sort of. The whole, you went in and the whole place smelled like grain or something. It was like a whole different deal. You couldn't just go to the store and, okay. Hey, there's a dead bird in this bucket of dead chicken parts. I'm suing. <laughs> so if you find a dead sparrow in your bucket of dead chicken, what's the difference? One of them is dirty, one of them is clean. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I guarantee those chickens that you're eating were no cleaner than that sparrow when they went into the pot. Uh, there's really no difference, but uh, it's a PR job. We sell ourselves these ideas that uh, don't necessarily stand for anything. I warned you about the hormones and all that meat and dairy you eat. He's got the cow boobies. <laughs> so the, 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 um, there are ethical, there are vegetarians that consider themselves ethical vegetarians. They're vegetarian because they don't want to hurt animals, but they will drink, uh, they will consume dairy products and eggs because it doesn't, because, you know, um, procuring those products does not kill the animal. But, uh, and, and in a, in a, on a one-on-one -on -one situation, that may be true, but in, when it comes to commercial eggs and commercial dairy, those animals go through way more personal agony than the ones that are slaughtered for meat. And when they're finished, when they, when they can't give milk or eggs anymore, they're slaughtered for meat. Uh, they live horrible existences for a much longer time than the ones that are just raised for meat. So if you're, a, if you're an ethical vegetarian, please think again and stop subsidizing the dairy and egg industry. Your heart will thank you. I'll thank you. Probably some strangers will thank you, but uh, the animals will certainly thank you. This is, this is where your milk comes from. Uh, this, is wh this is who the milk belongs to. This is a baby, a baby cow. Can you see what he's doing there? Yeah, he's, it's kind of hard to see him. It's a veal cow, uh, a baby calf who's taken away from his mom at about a day or two days old. He cries like crazy, like any baby would. Cattle, and I'm here to tell you from personal experience because I've worked on the, the farm animal sanctuary for a number of years now, cattle are extremely good mothers. They're very emotional creatures. They're not stupid like average people think they are. A mother cow cries for days when they take her baby away, and all the other cattle around her will, will cry and bay and moo too. Many people tend to think that human beings have a monopoly on emotions, but we, but we absolutely don't. Emotions are a very primitive function. All animals, birds, mammals, they all have emotions. Fear, happiness, grief, sorrow, contentment, anxiety. These are things that all animals experience. We, you know, it's, it's just a very primitive thing. It's, now, they don't have incredibly complex emotions like we do. They don't feel unfulfilled because their brother-in-law has a better job than they do at the same age. I mean, you know, they're not like that. Their emotions aren't that messed up like ours are. But... They don't, you know, they don't have to like all run off to California to to find themselves, but they, but they do have basic emotions that all of us would, all of us experience. So they can tell when, you know, when when these things happen to them, they they grieve and 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 scream in sorrow. I mean, it's really a miserable thing. So anyway, this is where. So this is the thing about another uh, debunking the whole deal about uh, milk not being cruel is that. Um, when dairy cattle, they have to be just like just like humans would. They have to be impregnated regularly to continue to give milk at a high rate. They're not just magical milk machines like Homer Simpson thinks. They're, um, they actually have to be impregnated like all mammals. And, um, and then as soon as the baby's born, well, they can't give the milk to that baby because they're going to sell it to you. So the baby, if it's a female, she heads to the, to the farm to be um, uh, turned into another milk machine like her mother. And if it's a male, sold to a veal farmer, thrown into a crate, tied up for a few months, and then slaughtered. So if you wouldn't eat veal, don't buy milk. That's all I'm saying. Now, this is one uh, that actually this little guy here... Uh, we rescued years ago, and he now lives at Woodstock Farm Animal Sanctuary. It's a very happy ending. He grew up healthy and strong. Here he is out in the field playing. <laughs> playing with a big red ball. Isn't he sweet? <clears throat> 
He does actually live there, too. Now, this is a chicken that we rescued in uh, Brooklyn, and you can see that she's missing a whole lot of feathers. Uh, her beak is blunted because it was cut off as a baby so that she could be crammed into tiny cages with a lot of other chickens. And, and she survived, too. She had a happy ending. But this is, this is, a typical, this is typically what uh, egg-laying chickens look like. They're just, they're like that. They're, they're barely alive. A lot of them die. They don't even take them out of the cages. They're crammed in these wired cages. It's horrible what they do to egg layers. Then they starve them and uh, take away their water for two weeks to get them to lay their final egg or two at the end of their life. And then they send them off to a slaughterhouse. So if you're not pleased with that idea, stop buying commercial eggs. But she has a happy ending, too. She grew up and became this. No, I'm sorry. That might be the wrong slide. Yeah, that's a woman in a Hello Kitty outfit. There she is. That's actually not her, but imagine if that was her. If that chicken was red, that would be her. She is actually at the farm, but I don't have a picture of her. That's me at Woodstock Farm Animal Sanctuary holding up one of the other rescued chickens. And you'll notice I have a cigar in my mouth there. I smoke cigars, and uh, a lot of people are shocked by that. they like, uh, you're a vegan and you smoke cigars? I could be a vegan and smoke cigars. That doesn't make sense because uh, cigars don't have any animal products in them. I'm an ethical vegan. If I was all about the health thing, then I probably wouldn't smoke them. But you don't inhale cigars, see, so... And I'm not eating meat, so I figure I'm probably, you know... And I don't want to live forever. This world's miserable, right? It's nasty. I don't want to live... I mean, God, 40 years from now, we're all going to be underwater. i gotta, I got to get something to kill me off. i got to have a vice, since I kicked the heroin. <laughs> so anyway, that was Woodstock Farm Animal Sanctuary. WoodstockFAS.org Or... WoodstockSanctuary.org. I'd love it if you guys would go to the website. It's free. It doesn't cost anything to visit the website. And uh, have a look. See the farm. Maybe give us a couple bucks a month to, um, you know, to help uh, feed the, the animals. We've got like 100 animals there. It's really cool. Now, when I was in Maui last week, I was at uh, Laura Lee, who is a member of the society here. She has a little sanctuary over there in Maui that's very cool. You should visit it sometime. She has a couple of donkeys that are amazingly sweet. You can't believe how sweet these donkeys are. They actually like to kiss you on the mouth. If you haven't kissed a donkey on the mouth, you haven't kissed something with lips the size of your head. I guess is a good way to put it. I mean, I'm not talking French kissing. It's just basic, you know, kissing, like that kind of kissing. But it's, it's fun, and they are so sweet. And then she's got some chickens and some goats, and uh, they were all rescued from horrible situations, and they're so happy to be alive, and they love to tell you about it. Pop quiz! Okay, let's do another pop quiz. Let's see what we got. Which of the following conditions have you visited a healthcare professional for in the past two years? A, memory loss. B, disorientation. C, black eye. D, unexplained appearance of tattoos. E, strong odor of Jack Daniels and cigarettes accompanied by severe headache and nausea. F, unknown person in your bed. G, loss of self-respect. The answer to this one in the answer key is, um, if you answered all of the above, we have to party sometime. Is the species that attacked you in the courtroom now, and can you identify it? You may notice that in the middle of the globe there is Hawaii. Uh, yeah, so this is the environmental thing. The UN Committee on Agricultural something or other, very, very official fancy name, it's absolutely true, last, I think it came out last year, they produced this big long study, several years long, and it's called a Livestock's Long Shadow was the name of the study. But what they discovered was they were looking for the amount of greenhouse gas uh, emitted and endangered and blah, 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 all, the, all contributed, the amount of greenhouse gas contributed by the agricultural industry. And what they found out was that that industry is tied for first place with coal, coal burning and coal production. So it's about electricity. Coal production and animal agriculture together. Those, are the, that's, those two are the, tied for the number one contributor to greenhouse gases. Number one, ahead of all transportation combined. So we like to recycle, we like to buy our, our uh, hybrid cars and all that kind of stuff. You could do way more by not buying animal products. Th this, th that industry is destroying the planet. And let me just give you an idea of one way that they're doing it. I mean, everybody knows about the methane. Cows release methane constantly from both ends. The, the, the front end, which would be the mouth, the burping. The back end, which would be the other thing and the other thing, which we don't want to say on tape. 
they release it constantly, right? And this methane is like a horrible greenhouse gas. Now, think about this, though. How many people are on the planet, like 6 billion plus? 6 billion plus people on the planet. Now, imagine if there, we had no sewage system whatsoever, and all of, the, all of the, the waste that 6 billion people were releasing was just released into the fields into ponds, lakes, rivers, what would the world be like? It would be disgusting, would it not? If we had no sewage treatment, and, and, right? And that's six billion of us. At any given moment in time, there are a hundred billion farm animals alive on the planet. They have no sewage treatment system. They just, it just goes into the groundwater, into the air, into the rivers, into the lakes, etc. It's a huge environmental disaster. And the UN talked about this in there in there uh, so the single most effective thing you can do as an environmentalist is to stop consuming or buying animal products it's just a fact not that you have to do it but it is a fact how about you spend less time studying how my generation destroyed the environment and more time figuring out a magical solution we tend to think that no matter how much we mess up some egghead, some brainiac is going to come along and fix everything, come up with some kind of a magic pill that will fix everything. This is a domino situation where the dominoes are already falling and there is no magic pill. I mean, we simply have to stop living the way we do. You hear this all the time. And now I'd like each of you to tell me what you would have liked to be when you grow up had your predecessors not doomed you to a catastrophic wasteland. <laughs> I don't mean to be too much of a downer, not like I haven't already, but I feel sorry for kids today because they're really, they're talking about like 40 years from now, North America may be unable to produce food because of climate change. 40 years from now. Any kid born now is going to be alive 40 years from now. What are they going to eat? I mean, they're unable to grow crops. Can you imagine all of North America being basically like North Africa? Just can't grow crops there anymore. The weather's not right. That's not, and that doesn't even mention the pollution and stuff that's involved. So, uh, you know, and that's not a radical idea. That's just like kind of basic science. It, it, could, it could very well happen in, in your lifetime. This is one reason I smoke. I don't want to live to see that. <laughs> just in case any of you are worried. So there's way too many people on the planet. We just, we, we simply, we all want to live well. I do too. I, I have cable TV, you know, I have internet. I fly in planes. I want to live well, just like everybody else. I mean, you know, and the, and the, the better we get at these things, the more, more societies, more third world countries we, we drag into, into our style of living and the more pollution it causes. The bottom line is there's just way too many people on this planet, way too many humans. We don't die young enough like we used to. Uh, we, we don't die of diseases like we used to. We, you know, we just continue to reproduce and reproduce and live and live and live. And anyway, so I am, I'm a huge advocate of not reproducing. What would it cost if I set my husband in to get the dog neutered and you pulled a last-minute switcheroonie? <laughs> this is an important message to you. From, this is one of my most important messages. Ladies, neuter your men. You don't, if, do, not, do not breed. It's just like with dogs. You don't need to... Don't go to a breeder. Go to a shelter. There's plenty of abandoned dogs in the shelters. If you want a kid, go to a shelter. There's a lot of babies on this planet with no parents. Go get one of those. The last thing... I know it's hard to imagine. The last thing this planet needs is another copy of you. <laughs> now, a lot of people think I'm a hypocrite because I have two daughters. Okay. Okay, I have two daughters. But they're grown. They're already adults. I didn't know this when they were little. I didn't know when I had kids that, it was, that they, the humans were destroying the planet. And to put my money where my mouth is, I killed them both, composted them, and planted a couple of trees. <laughs> and I am now, I am now the proud owner of a vasectomy. I'm not going to show you my scar. I think that would be over the line, but... I did get a vasectomy, and I'm telling you, I highly recommend it. Not a big deal. Best birth control in the world. Not very expensive. And if you can't afford it, like I, I, don't, have, I don't have good health insurance. I'm, uh, you know, I'm uh, what do you call it, freelance. You know, I don't work for anybody, so I don't have a great health insurance plan. I don't want to pay a ton of money for a vasectomy, so here's what you can do. It's what I did. Make friends with a veterinarian. <laughs> Become drinking buddies with a veterinarian. Slip them a few bucks. It's a very simple operation. They do it all the time. Slip them a few bucks. You're in and out of the office in 30 minutes. And if you can stand a couple of days with the plastic cone collar on, you're f home free.
All right, it's time for blindfolded cartooning. I'm now going to draw a portrait of a, of a member of the audience while blindfolded. Yes, it's a little, little party trick that I like to do. Uh, so I need a volunteer, the first person to volunteer. Guess it, oh, oh you're, you're not volunteering yourself, you're pointing to your friend. Do you want to do it? Do you want to do it? you want to do it? All right, just race on up here then. They're applauding because you can walk. Uh, what is your name? Carlos. That's Carlos. And have we ever met before? We, you said hello over there, so no. <laughs> so we did meet before over there, but we, but, but, yeah. but, so that means no, we've never met. Yeah, that's no. <laughs> All right. It doesn't matter. No. We didn't talk about this, did we? No. no. Okay. Because, you know, we want to make sure that it's a legitimate kind of a trick. And all. all right. So this is my blindfold. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to try it on and show the audience and tell, ascertain for the audience that you cannot see through it. Hold on now. I'm, 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 I'm getting there. Carlos is very anxious. He wants this to be over with. He can't wait to get back to his seat. How old are you? 21. 21. I was never 21. <laughs> all right. Can you see through that blindfold? No. Absolutely not. No. How many fingers am I holding up? <laughs> okay. All right. So let me just tie it on, and I'll draw a portrait of you while blindfolded. All right. You stand there. All right. Here we go. Some idiot once told me they thought I was going to be blindfolded during this. I'm like, how could I draw without being able to see? That's just stupid. All right. Okay, I'm going to start out. I'm going to start out with uh, the blindfold because that's kind of the easiest thing to draw. All right, there's that. And uh, now the uh, get a little. Uh, you got a beard. I like the beard. That's nice. That uh, distinguishes you from people without beards, and that's always a good thing. I'm going to draw you as a pirate. Do you mind? Just because it's like better clothes and stuff. It's more fun to draw a pirate outfit with a frilly shirt and stuff than just regular t-shirt and jeans. So I'm just going to do you as a pirate. It's always fun. Now one of the, um, <clears throat> I, should, I should mention that uh, one reason that cartoonists love to draw, what are you doing? Are you adjusting it? Is it falling off? Yeah, that's good. That's, you're allowed to do that. It's okay. I like that. He's, he's a self-motivator. All right. Now uh, one reason that, um, <clears throat> that cartoonists like to draw pirates is because it's the only way that uh, we can get away with, with doing a joke about a disability of any kind. Because if you draw like a, a couple of old ladies at Walmart with a hook hand and a, and a patch on their eye, it's just not funny. People feel sorry for them. But if it's a pirate, everybody's like, oh yeah, it's a pirate. Cool. He's losing, he's missing stuff. He's got all kind of, you know. So I'm going to give you a peg leg. And uh, there you go. Now here's a part where you get to... Um, choose. Do you want to uh, have a, a parrot sitting on your shoulder, or do you want to be sitting on the shoulder of a parrot? Choice two, please. All right, choice two. He wants to be sitting on the shoulder of a parrot. So we'll do that. There we go. All right. That's very nice. Do you, uh, does your parrot have a name? Toby. Toby. All right. Let's do that. Okay. Now, the last thing I'm going to do is uh, we're going to... Do you know why? This is a little bit of parrot... Uh, not parrot trivia. Pirate trivia. Oh, that's funny. I never noticed how, how close those words are, parrot and pirate. Do you know why a pirate's hat always has a uh, skull and crossbones on it? Because they're poisonous. If you eat one, you could die. All right. <laughs> now, you can... Uh, okay, Carlos, you can take off your blindfold and see the portrait. What do you think? There's, uh, uh, you're Carlos, right? I got that right. Is that how you spell it? Yeah. Good. And uh, this is your parrot, Dennis. <laughs> I'll sign it for you. You can keep this. Would you like to keep this drawing? Love you. Thanks. Well, you can't. I don't give these away. <laughs> these are expensive. I spent like... Where's the pie? The dynamite? <clears throat> he seems a little... Uh, I don't know what's... That guy's hallucinating or something. He's talking about pie and dynamite, so... All right, so there, oh, is he really? Maybe he would like to be the next victim. All right, there you go. There's a pie and a dynamite. And uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, ask that guy that was shouting about it. Okay, now uh, let me have the, uh, I like the blindfold back. Thank you very much. A hand for Carlos. Thank you. All right.
<laughs> All right, I'm going to do one more portrait. Who wants to, uh, does, the, uh, does your friend, the, uh, the noisy man? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, let's see, what am I, uh, okay, there's that. And just put these on. Does that, does that fit? You Good can, enough. You can put that on yourself, yeah. You put that on yourself, and then we'll just, like, put that right there. Okay. That, no, that, that'll come off. That'll come off easy. It's, it's like the crappiest tape in the world. And then this. All right, and now you just stand there like that. All right, perfect. Self-portrait? This is, that's a portrait of you. You look pretty, actually pretty hot like that. To you know, admit. It's, it's all the hat. It's, what it's, it is. It's, it's all about the hat, yes. Uh, okay, is, the, is, the, is that uh, nose thing comfortable? Yeah, absolutely. Is it really? See, I, I would have to disagree. <laughs> this is a little portrait I call Welcome to My Hell. Yeah, there you go. And it's J-A-C-O-B? Yeah, absolutely. There you go. There's a portrait of Jacob. <laughs> All right. All right, and I'll put a little signature on it. And I'll put an alien. Because uh, you seem to be the kind of person who likes that sort of thing. And, uh, and then maybe a, a little hidden K-2. Now, what is the K-2? He's asking what the K2 is. Okay, let me have my stuff back. All right. I wish I could take it off that easily. All right. Everybody give Jacob a big hand, and, uh, and, I'll, and I'll explain the uh, K2 thing. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, there you go. Just, just pull that. There you go. Thank you, Jacob. Sir. Um, so, in a lot of my cartoons I have, uh, or in virtually, in virtually all my cartoons, I have these little... Um, these little uh, sort of uh, uh, little objects hidden in the cartoons, like a piece of pie, a firecracker, an alien, a little K2, which stands for my daughter's names. My daughters, I have two daughters um, whose names both start with K. <clears throat> the oldest one is Krapizar, and the younger one is Krelspeth. <laughs> and then uh, sometimes I put like a, a shoe. So anyway, there's a bunch of different little secret symbols. And on my website, bizarro.com, bizarro... Dot com. All right. Now, it's important to spell it like that. If you spell it any other way, it's a porn site. I kid you not. I mean, this is a very pro popular name in the porn site world. I don't know why. Well, maybe I do know why. I don't know. But So anyway, go to my website. And on my website, uh, at the bottom of the homepage, there's a bunch of little links. And one of them says secret symbols. And you can click on the secret symbols. And there's a lot of elaborate philosophical explanations for each one, which you will doubtless find uh, humorous and helpful on your personal journey. Uh, through life. <laughs> so the hardest thing about being a cartoonist is uh, doing a cartoon a day. I've been doing this uh, since 1985, 23 years, 23 years, and I do it seven days a week. That's 365 cartoons a year for 23 years. That is well over a hundred jokes I have had to write. <laughs> And that is the hardest thing about being a cartoonist. Not just drawing a picture every day, but coming up with an idea every day. What else do we have here for you? Must you do that in public? Chicken breastfeeding. <clears throat> so would you rather see someone feeding their child what nature meant for them to eat or some piece of a dead bird? Uh, this is actually sort of, uh, this joke um, uh, appeals to vegetarians and the, and, and the sorts, but um, I actually kind of based this one on my wife, who, who is the one who uh, kind of introduced me to this whole world. And she's the sort who will say, who will say things to people, not, not in mean or judgmental ways, but she will actually engage other people in conversations about animal issues. And I, I'm not that sort. I do the cartoons and stuff, but I don't really, I don't really uh, drive it home with the, you know, I don't, I don't go around harassing people in public. But my wife does occasionally harass people in public. So this was, uh, <laughs> this was a, uh, this cartoon is sort of based on her. This is actually, this is my wife. Uh, on my blog, actually on my website, bizarro.com, you can go to the bottom and it says Dan's blog. Click on that. I have a daily blog where I post a cartoon and, and tell stories. And I'll have pictures of this trip, in fact, and I'll tell stories about that. It's very funny and entertaining and free, and you'll love it. And it's a great way to waste time at work. This picture is on my blog, and uh, because of that, on my blog, she became known as CHNW, which stands for Crazy Half-Naked Wife. Now, she's clearly half-naked. She's wearing a, um, a bikini made of cabbage and lettuce. 
and she's holding a sign that says, uh, protect your ticker. And she's out in front of the New York Stock Exchange handing out vegetarian pamphlets. You know, it's just a way to attract attention and hand out pamphlets. Yes, very good. Now, what makes, her, what makes her not just half naked but also crazy is that it was 29 degrees that day. It was January of 08, last January, and she was out there for about an hour like that. Got all kinds of attention for two different reasons. <laughs> She's here tonight. I don't want to embarrass her by uh, making her stand up and taking a bow or anything, but I don't want to point her out, but <clears throat> if you see anybody that looks like this, in the audience, that's probably her. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> this is my favorite picture of her. That's her taking a picture, taking a photo at a bar in uh, Montreal at a party we were at. She's a little bit subdued, <laughs> kind of shy. Uh, if, you, if you're nice to her, you might be able to coax her out of her shell. There we go. This is more typical of her. We foster a lot of animals in Brooklyn. And uh, this is a lamb that was uh, ended up being rescued in, on Long Island and found her way to our found his way to our house and she's feeding him with a bottle like a little baby. Oh my God, how cute! And everywhere that Ashley went, the lamb was sure to go. I'm not kidding. That's where the thing because this lamb imprinted on her and followed her everywhere, 24 hours a day. It had to be right next to her, and that's where that suddenly it occurred to me. That's where the nursery rhyme comes from because lambs really do this apparently. Anyway, he's actually a big grown up sheep now. And he's at, uh, is he at Farm Sanctuary? Or? Yeah, he's at Farm Sanctuary in upstate New York. <clears throat> New York, excuse me. All right, anyway, there's a, so there's a book called Bizarro and Other Strange Manifestations of the Art of Dan Perraro. It's lighter, lighter colored than that. It's actually blue. It's not like navy blue. Uh, it's a retrospective of my career. It's about that big. It's about that thick. It's got all kinds of art in it. Uh, 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 all kinds of art. You love it. Just, just buy it. It comes with a personal guarantee. If you're not 100% satisfied, you can just give it to somebody else. So... <laughs> Here's a fun joke. It has nothing to do with vegetarianism. It's the cat barber. <laughs> yeah, it's just a joke. All right, I think this is the end of my talk here. Yeah, gracias, mi vegetarianos amigos. Actually, it should say mahalo, mahalos. Here's, here's Dr. Carl Seff. We're finished now. We've had a marvelous talk. I hope everybody's enjoyed it. For those of you that haven't had a meal in about an hour, there's some marvelous food courtesy of Down to Earth in the back. Thank you for coming, and uh, please come next week, next month. <laughs> Aloha. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.